Good afternoon. Hello. Welcome. Welcome, everyone. It's day two of the Toronto International Film Festival. I hope you're getting to see lots of good films, lots more to come, and you've come to the right place. This is the North American premiere of the new film by Nadine Labaki, Capernaum. My name is Cameron Bailey. I'm the artistic director here. I'm very pleased to be presenting this film to you. Uh, I want to begin by acknowledging the land that we're on. This is the treaty territory of the Mississaugas of the New Credit and the traditional territory of the um, uh, Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and the Huron-Wendat First Nations. They've been looking after this land for thousands of years, and we thank them for sharing it with us. Um, I want to remind you that this film is eligible for the Grolsch People's Choice Award. Uh, I think you may know how that works. You vote for it. So please make sure to vote. You can do that online at tiff.net slash vote, uh, either on your uh, computer or your phone or whatever device you have that connects to the interwebs. Um, big thanks to Mongrel Media and Sony Pictures Classics for providing us with this film and also to Wild Bunch. We are so pleased to have Nadine Labaki back at the festival. She's um, born and raised in Lebanon, uh, studied at uh, Beirut St. Joseph University, and has gone on to a remarkable international career as a filmmaker. Her credits as a director include Caramel, which played here at the festival in 2007 in our gala program. Was someone here for Caramel? Yes, right here, amazing. Beautiful film. And most recently, in 2011, she had Where Do We Go Now, which won our People's Choice Award. Capernaum premiered at Cannes. Um, Nadine Labaki has always been, I think, one of the most sharply observant storytellers in cinema. In Capernaum, in her new film, I think you'll find all of that and a new intensity, almost a ferocity to the storytelling, which I really appreciated. I was first able to see it when it premiered uh, at the Cannes Film Festival. So I will just say, get ready to go on this journey. And Nadine has uh, come to introduce the film to you today. Please join me in welcoming the director of Capernaum, Nadine Labaki. The emotion started again. <laughs> uh, I'm so honored and happy to be here again because um, a few years ago when I came with Where Do We Go Now and with Caramel, uh, the warmth and the love that you gave me is something I will never forget in my life. Uh, thank you for giving so much emotions to the filmmakers. Thank you for being so generous with us. We need it sometimes when we're uh, afraid when we're anxious and the love and, and, and the generosity and the warmth you give give us so much uh, courage to continue. Uh, I wish Zane was with us tonight. He's the hero, our beautiful hero. Um, and unfortunately, Zane is, um, couldn't make it because uh, he, he was resettled in Norway. Zane is a Syrian refugee who is living in Lebanon for the past few years in, very difficult uh, in a very difficult situation. But now, lucky, luckily for us and for him and for everyone, he's been resettled in Norway with all his family. So he cannot, he couldn't make it uh, because he, he needs to, we need to figure out uh, his papers and all that. So. I wish he was here because I wanted him to feel um, your warmth and the con your connection, hopefully, to the film. I'm not going to be too long. I'm just going to tell you that the film is the, the result of four years of research when I, uh, where I went to many difficult places in Lebanon and spoke to many children. And what you see is really, in what you're going to see is really inspired by a lot of things that they've told me. And unfortunately, the reality is sometimes harsher than what you're going to see in the film. I hope you're going to connect with it. And I hope it will open the debate. Um, because we need to talk about what's happening. Uh, I just want to thank my, uh, again, uh, Cameron Bailey for having me again here. Um, and the 
uh, Toronto Film Festival for having me back here. I want to thank especially my new extended family, uh, Vincent Maraval, uh, Rog Sutherland, Jason Cliot, Joanna Vincenti, um, who else? Uh, Michael Barker, thank you so much for having me here. And um, I want to thank also my editor who's here with us tonight, Const Constantine Bock, and you're going to see him, uh, I think, with the, uh, later on with the Q&A. So thank you so much, and I'm not going to be too long. I hope you're going to enjoy it. Okay, please join me in welcoming back to the stage the director of Capernaum, Nadine Labaki. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Where's Consti? Constantine. Thank you. Thank you so much. Where are you? <laughs> Um, okay, I think uh, I'd like to start off, Nadine, just by asking you about how you came to find this particular story. I know that you spent a lot of time in refugee camps and had hours and hours of footage, and I'm just wondering, you know, why it was this story that you came to tell. Um, I think I'm, I'm not the only one concerned with the, with the problem. I think it's, uh, it's a problem that's been um, growing uh, lately, uh, not only in Lebanon, but in many other countries. And the sight of these children um, facing extreme neglect everywhere in my country and uh, in a lot of other countries is something that uh, we are facing every day. And it was only normal for me to, I think, wanting to know more uh, why? Why? Where? What happened? Why did we? Where did we get to that point? How did we get to the point where uh, we are accepting uh, this injustice and 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 what's happening to these kids that didn't ask to be here actually and that are paying the price of our mistakes and our faults and our stupid wars and um, and so I wanted to know more. I wanted to understand. Uh, how did the system fail these kids uh, to the fact to the to the extent that they become completely excluded from the system excluded from society that they become completely invisible and it's a vicious circle that uh, also extends to their families their community so it becomes a whole community of people completely excluded from the system and excluded from life and just hanging on the fringes and on the margins of our lives and our society. So that's how it started. I wanted to know more. Wh what happened to this kid when uh, he goes around the corner and disappears and I don't see him anymore? Where does he go? Who is he? Uh, what does he feel? Um, how does he think? Who's his family? I wanted to know more. So I spent the last four years researching a lot, going to many, many difficult places in Lebanon. I went to many camps. I went to uh, very uh, difficult neighborhoods in Lebanon, to prisons for minors, detention centers. I spent a lot of time in courts trying to understand how the system works and how uh, the judicial system works and how, how come it fails so much. And so I, I saw many kids and spoke to many people and uh, at the end of the conversation, most of the time, I would ask these kids uh, one question, which is, are you happy to be alive? Are you happy to be here? So most of the time, unfortunately, the answer was no. I'm, I'm, I, I don't belong here. I don't belong in your world. Uh, I didn't ask. <laughs> I didn't ask to be here. Why am I punished? Uh, is this, uh, I'm sorry, is this my only purpose to just be, uh, uh, not eat when I'm hungry and not have the love I deserve? So that's how the story started and it became the story of this kid who was, because I wanted to be, be the voice uh, of these kids. So 
it became the story of this kid who was going to sue his parents and s through uh, suing his parents, he was actually suing a whole society, uh, suing a whole system because he's born, because um, he's born without uh, having the, the least of, of his basic rights. And yeah, that's how it started. <laughs> Um, I mean, I think that you can really feel your love for the characters in this story. And, uh, you know, I think we should acknowledge the amazing performances of everybody in the film, and particularly the young cast. And I'm wondering if you can tell me, uh, I'm myself a mother of two toddlers, um, and I think you managed to get some amazing performances out of everybody in the film. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you found them and also what it was like to work with them. Um, it was... Uh, the way we found them also was very particular because it's a very particular way of, 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 of working. I, I have a, a, cr a crew of, of casting recruiters who are amazing and who go everywhere and, and interview a lot of children and interview a lot of people. And it was very important for me that, I, um, that these kids don't act, that I had a problem with the word acting. I needed them to be just be exactly who they are, bring their own experience in the film, bring sometimes their own words, their, their just their own life and what they know. And it also applies to everyone in the film. Everybody is almost uh, playing their own role and their life is very similar to their life in the film. Their life in, in real life is very similar to their life in the film. So in order to achieve this, uh, I wanted to b believe in what I was doing. So for me, time was the most important thing. That's, how, that's why we spent six months of shooting. We have over 500 hours of rushes. Because I wa we wanted to be at the service of who they are, not the other way. I, I, I had to adapt to their rhythm and not adapt them to our rhythm. So we had to just observe and just know how to become invisible in order to capture their reality. Of course, there's a fiction and you need to follow the fiction, and, but it was a, a continuous choreography, a dance between fiction and reality, between what they were giving me as reality and how I should navigate this, this truth towards the fiction we had written. So it was a very um, specific dance that, that we, we, we had to do all the time so we can um, achieve that. And, 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 and reality and fiction kept bumping into each other in, in the film. It was like, for me, it was almost like a reassurance that what we are doing is real. Uh, and three days after uh, we shot the scene where Rahil is being arrested, uh, she was arrested in real life because she was exactly in the same situation. She was illegal in the country, didn't have any papers, was working also invisible. A and so she got caught while we were shooting. And at that point, we, c we weren't able to have her papers ready. So she got caught and she... Uh, went to prison and lived exactly what what we were shooting in the film, and the same applies to the parents of of the little baby. Uh, in in life, uh, she's she's a girl. Her name is Treasure, and she was really our treasure in the film. She was really heaven sent, and uh, and she exactly like 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 Rahil was was caught. Her parents were caught because they were together. So they got caught. So when we were shooting Treasure without her mom in the film, wh while she was without her mom in the film, she was really without her mom in real life. So she, we, we, the casting director had, had to take her uh, in and, and she was our baby for three weeks and we had to take care of her. And, and so it was, there was something, I don't know, beyond us, something that was... Um, guiding us in, in, in this film and guiding us to find the truth and to try to tell the truth as much as we could because it's important that that we understand that this is not a f just only a fiction it's not just another film this is happening in, in, in life and 
and it's happening a lot. And what's happening to Zain is happening to many, many other children. It's thousands and millions of children around the world who are facing neglect, who are in, you know, having to work. Uh, there's m millions of kids in child labor. Uh, and, and I think we should acknowledge that this is a reality and, and I think we should stop looking away because the problem is too big. And this is what we sometimes do, unfortunately. We turn away because we feel helpless, we feel hopeless, we don't know where to start and how we can start a change. So we look away because we don't want to see reality, but I think we should, we should start um, acknowledging the problem and trying to see how we can find a solution. What I'm saying might sound a little bit naive, but I truly believe in the power of each one of us and, and how we can really, um, at least if we look differently at these kids and we, this, the change can start. Uh, yeah. Well, I think your film goes a long way in helping to achieve that. All right, I'd like to open it up to any of you here. Uh, yes, you're standing near the aisle waving your hand in blue. Yeah. Yep. Hi. So, I think, I think I understand what you're getting at. I'll just repeat that for everybody else. Um, so the woman that asked the question is uh, from Egypt and really commented on Nadine's ability to have a sort of female lens when she approaches her projects. And this is something that you don't often get from the region. So wondering if you could talk a bit about what your experience is like there and what inspired you to be able to become the filmmaker that you are. Um, I think that the the simple fact that you see it from a, from a um, woman's perspective is is because I'm a woman. <laughs> I mean, I am I'm I'm working with everything I know, with uh, who I am, with uh, my whole being, and the fact that I'm a woman gives you this new, this different perspective. And and I think it's very it's 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 very important that we have this perspective. It's uh, and and I think the fact that also I am per I am a mother also gives me the maybe uh, the right kind of um, uh, reactions or instinct towards, towards things. And, and actually, at the same time that uh, I was shooting the film, I was also breastfeeding my baby. So, so maybe also, you know, the small details of how Rahil is with her baby and how she breastfeeds her baby and the problem with the milk and and all that is also something that I was personally living at the same time so so I think you yeah you you bring whatever you know uh, and and you try to be as true as possible to who you are and and it's just that okay more questions from the audience is there anybody in the balcony before I come down here okay yes just at the front row of the balcony Ah, can, can you explain the significance of the title? Okay, it's a <laughs> long story. <laughs> uh, it's actually in, in French, Cafarnaum means, cha means chaos. It was uh, originally, this is a village in Palestine, and, and, it's, uh, and then later on, uh, it became, uh, the word became used to signify chaos, to signify hell, disorder. So uh, uh, people started using it in French li literature and Arabic literature to signify hell. So when I was, uh, when we, we started uh, sh uh, working on the film, started writing the film, uh, we just sat and we put all the themes that we wanted to talk about on a board. And, you know, it was about um, 
the, the, the injustice and, and the children's rights, it was about migrant workers, it's about the absurdity of having to have a paper to exist in life, and all these subjects that uh, I, 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 I we talk about in the film. So I, I look back at, at the board and I go to my uh, co-writers, this is, c'est un cafarnaum, this is chaos, this is complete disorder, and that's how the story of the title started, and, and actually the title uh, was there even before we started writing. So it sort of also drove me uh, and, and was, a, yeah, it was the fuel to, to make this film. Thank you, okay, uh, just towards the aisle in the middle here, yep. Uh, sorry, could you, did you? Why, why, why is it? Because it signifies, Kafarnaum in, f in French and in Arabic literature, signifies chaos. It's a word that you use to signify chaos, hell, disorder, that's why. No, uh, yeah, it doesn't. We're talking about a very specific uh, problem in Lebanon. This is a film that's happening in, in Lebanon, but it's to signify. It's used to signify. It's it's not the literal um, uh, signification to the title. It's it's what it's it, it's used to signify usually in in, in literature. Um, I had actually been going to the gentleman just behind. Yes, welcome. Shukran. So the comment is just about the authenticity and the very real feeling of the film, and specifically the language. Um, and he wanted to ask, you know, maybe which scenes or how many scenes were improvised versus scripted, and um, maybe also Constantine could maybe speak about what it was like to put together as well from that perspective. Of course, the script originally is, there's a written script, there's a solid script, but I, we were very much open to improvisation, so it was very important for me not to feel that it was scripted. So the more they used their own words, the more I was happy, the happier I was, the more convinced I was with their performance. For me, of course, there is a script to follow because you need to tell a story, but I was open to whatever life and truth was gonna give us. So it was a very free process. Uh, it was very structured in, 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 in the fact that we needed to tell a story, so we needed to know where we were going. There was no, we weren't just filming and not knowing what was gonna happen next. But inside the scene itself, we were open to whatever life was gonna bring our way. And I was not, I, I wasn't uh, paralyzed in, in a certain uh, script or a certain um, uh, dialogue. I, I, I just, w we were very free uh, to absorb whatever was gonna come our way uh, that was different from the script. And sometimes we would even uh, drift from the script a lot and go back to it and, and it's all um, the, 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 the original uh, length of the film was 12 hours. <laughs> so you can imagine <laughs> how much more things we shot, but maybe, maybe Constantine can talk al also about this a bit. And the uh, hell he had to go through <laughs> to make the film. Maybe just an anecdote um, to, um, to talk about the how improvised it is. The, I was, my Arabic is very limited. I can have a pretty good conversation about child abuse, but that's about it after two years now. Um, and I was editing with an English translation of the script, but we very soon realized that what was shot was the meaning of those pages, but I could not work with this English translation that was on paper because that's not at all what I was seeing. So we actually found someone who was on set translating live 
you know, like they do in, in, in Poland for, for sitcoms where one monotone voice dubs all the other voices. So we had one person that, as the take was being shot and people were improvising and, and, and taking the scenes into different directions sometimes, there was one person who would always talk in English so that I was able to work with that footage. And I had always, in my left ear, I always had her voice that was guiding me through all these poems and songs and stories that they were coming up with. Okay, we have time for one final question. I'm gonna to go to the front row. She's been very patient. Um, so, sorry, just uh, congratulations on a very moving film. Um, and also just curious as to what, is ha what has happened with the, with the real characters it's based on and if you've been able to keep track of them and in touch with them. Yeah, of course. I mean, they're now, they're almost family. It's very important that I, I keep track and that we keep talking to each other and we're still in contact. In Zane's um, uh, situation, uh, uh, it was very fortunate because uh, uh, right after the films, Zayn uh, and his whole family uh, were resettled in, in Norway, Norway. And just like uh, two weeks ago, uh, they left the country and they are now living in, in, in a great two-story house with five bedrooms. <laughs> and it's almost too good to be true in Hammerfest in, in Norway. He's going to go to school and all his uh, siblings are going to go to school. He's going to finally be able to have a childhood, to have a, to have a normal life like any other kid. And we're trying to work on all the other families. And the aim is for all the children in the film to be in school this year, uh, to be able to read and write, because none of them um, are in school. So now that's what we're working on, and we're in contact with all the all the kids and all the characters, and and hopefully, if the film opens the right debate, and uh, if the film is able to create um, this debate, we're going to be able to uh, find solutions, uh, hopefully, for for each and every one. But it's one step at a time. It's not easy, but it's one step at a time. Thank you, Nadine, again. Congratulations on the film, and thank you all for staying. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.